This is Maggie Rivas Rodriguez and Charlie Erickson. Uh, the date is June the 7th, and we're interviewing Guy Cavaldon for the U.S. Latino and Latina World War II Oral History Project. And Mr. Cavaldon, thank you very much for taking your time. We're sitting in your hotel room at the Wyndham Bristol Hotel in Washington, D.C. And the purpose of this interview is to find out a little bit more about what your life was before the war, during the war, and after the war. Um, Charlie has known you from before, and I've had a chance to read your book and to get a little bit more information. And I'd, I'd like to start out, um, if Charlie wouldn't mind, getting a little bit more detail about your early years, what mm -hmm. your life was like as a child. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get a lot of detail about your about your your father, mm -hmm. what your um, what, you know your parents growing up uh, in East LA. What was that like? Yeah. Well, my. Uh, my mom and dad are from the state of New Mexico. Uh, they go back, uh, both the Gavaldon and the Cernas go back several hundred years, so I'm told, in New Mexico. And uh, my mom was uh, postmistress in uh, Grants uh, uh, before I was born. They moved to California, I guess, in the early 20s. I was born in 1926 in uh, uh, East Los Angeles and uh, had a wonderful family. Uh, my mom and dad, very uh, uh, dedicated to uh, their seven children, there's seven of us, and... Uh, where did you fall in the birth order? Pardon? Where, where did you fall? You oh, uh, let's see, um, it was uh, Louie, and then Tito, Art, and then I was number four. Uh, of seven, mm -hmm. and uh, as I say, born in East LA, and, and um, went to St. Mary's uh, School in, on um, on uh, Fourth and uh, Breed Street, about uh, one long block from where we lived, on Chicago Street, and it was a very happy childhood. Uh, they say we were poor. I didn't know that. Uh, uh, we always had beans and tortillas, uh, and uh, I, uh, I love my pre-war Los Angeles. Uh, I uh, don't want to go back and live there now. Uh, however, it, it was a, uh, a happy childhood and, and, and a good moral upbringing uh, by my parents. But when I was about um, 11, 12 years old, I uh, met uh, some Japanese uh, Nisei in school and uh, we were palling around together and I uh, was ended up staying more with the Nisei or the Issei which is the first generation uh, Japanese than I was with my own uh, mom and dad and uh, I admired them they were always uh, they excelled in school they were honest people and they were uh, in in, uh, in problems with the law, and uh, so consequently, I, being that I admired them, I, I wanted to learn their customs and their language, and which I did, and which was to later help me when I joined the Marine Corps. But uh, yes, what what kind of work did your father do? He worked for the railroad for the. PFE, the Pacific Freight Express, he worked in the shops, he was a welder and a machinist. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, took care of his family very well. And, uh, as I say, uh, now they, they tell us that we were poor, but uh, uh, we are just a normal uh, family in Boyle Heights. And your mom stayed home with the kids? Yeah, good mother. Uh, very fine mother, and, and uh, I went back to New Mexico with her, I think when I was, oh, perhaps six or seven, and uh, we have a very uh, wonderful uh, background with uh, our people in New Mexico. My mom's uh, dad, Elias Serna, uh, he had, oh, I guess a half a section, which is a big amount of land in New Mexico, and he had uh, uh, cattle and horses, a lot of horses. And I remember when I was a kid, 
I, uh, second time I went, I guess I bought 12, and, I, and uh, he gave me a little Palomino mare, and it was, it was a beautiful life. I say this because later, in, after I got out of the Marine Corps, I told my wife, I said, you know, I, I enjoyed uh, New Mexico when I was a kid. I had a 22 rifle and a little pony. I says, uh, let's go try it. So we moved back there, but it's not the same New Mexico as I knew when I was a kid. And then my, uh, my grandfather on my dad's side, uh, very tough old hombre. He, was, uh, um, he had a bar, a cantina, up in, in the mountains between uh, Gallup and Grants, a place called Tinaja, near uh, Inscription Rock. And I went straight with him for a while. He's all by himself there. He's about 80 years old. And that's cold country up there. And the winter gets... Uh, down to 30 below zero. Uh, uh, many people don't realize that New Mexico has that uh, uh, that weather, uh, and uh, he would chop his own wood. and And I, I remember it at uh, every night. He had two cots in the room. I was, and uh, he'd uh, uh, had a 12 gauge shotgun that he'd check. He'd break it open and make sure there's shells in there and put it next to his cot. I used to wonder why, and uh, uh, then I'd wake up maybe two, three, four in the morning, and I'd hear some noises in, in the bar part of the building, and and I'd uh, crack open the door, and there was my my grandfather dealing cards, uh, uh, something like out of a John Wayne western, and uh, you you smell the spittoons and and the uh, and the chewing tobacco and the just very musty old wooden deck uh, yeah, floors. Were you know. these Anglo uh, ranchers that would come by or Mexicanos? Kind of no, no, they're, I don't remember any Anglos at all. They're all Mexicanos and, and I, I used to wonder where they came from. I mean, we're out in, in the boonies there, you know, and, and uh, I was very proud of my grandfather. He'd be dealing cars, half blind, I guess, by then. And, and uh, he uh, always had a little 44 as well as the, the shotgun remained in, in the bedroom next to his cot. And uh, then I realized why he'd make sure his shotgun was loaded every night. He had some rough characters come in. But, uh, then when he died, I noticed they had a, a little write-up in his obituary. He stated that uh, he w used to carry the mail and was a uh, teamster, uh, uh, a Pony Express rider and a teamster uh, in his younger days. and. Uh, the Indians were chasing him one time, and he threw the mailbags in, in the bushes and uh, uh, went to Fort Wingate and got some soldiers and went back and picked up the mailbags. So uh, I was very proud of my my uh, my forefathers. Let me ask you this. Um, in your book, you talk about uh, working in on Skid Row in East Los Angeles yeah. and shining shoes. Tell me tell me a little bit about that. What kinds of shoes? I was about you 10 years old, and, uh, you know, I wonder about this sometimes. I say, boy, did my mom or dad really care? But it was a different era. Back then, I don't think parents worried so much about a 10-year-old kid going out and maybe uh, staying out all night. Uh, today, uh, a 10-year-old kid couldn't do that, tear him apart. And I'd uh, jump on the uh, the cow catcher of the uh, the streetcars. We had the, the old uh, streetcars, the trolleys, I guess uh, they're called in other areas. And uh, uh, they they lift the rear cow catcher up, and uh, when they when they turned the streetcars around uh, to backtrack, and, and I would I remember jumping on uh, these uh, the streetcars and going uh, to uh, uh, Main Street. If I caught the uh, the F car, I believe it was went up third to uh, up fourth, which turned into four a uh, third and to Main Street, and I'd start my run there up and down Main Street and to Fifth, which is uh, Skid Row. Even today, it's still Skid Row. And I'd shine shoes there at uh, five cents a throw and sometimes at, at 10 cents. Uh, and um, oh, I'd make, uh, oh, maybe 50 cents or maybe a dollar, and it was a big money back then for a little 10-year-old kid. And I enjoyed it. I uh, enjoyed it very much. I think it was a great experience. Uh, and uh, uh, I... The, the people that were lived on Skid Row were these. Uh, I mean, you know, today people that we think of being on Skid Row probably wouldn't care about having their shoes shined. 
Why would these people care about having their shoes? Oh, I don't think I ever shine any bums, uh, uh. <laughs> hobo shoes. Uh, but uh, there are a lot of uh, Navajos, uh, say Texans or Okies, that, that uh, for one reason or another, they end up on Main Street. They go to the Follies and and the um, uh, the Hippodrome. Uh, uh, I remember um, uh, who was it? Eddie Canner, uh, uh, Al Jolson. Way before your time, I'm sure uh, they'd have a a, uh, a uh, they'd really put on a show. These different uh, who else? Uh, anyway, uh, so we'd get a lot of these uh, these guys, uh, cowboys we call them, uh, and uh, I'd shine their shoes. And uh, uh, I remember one incident. I think I have it in my book where uh, they looked at us. I guess as uh, uh, just little nobody Mexicans. And I remember this one guy says, "Hey, uh, uh, hey, boys, come here and shine my shoes, you know." And, and I says, "Get your put the mother to do it." And I ran and, and hid in one of the uh, one of the stores that I knew everybody, the the uh, the shopkeepers, and there's this Mister, oh, I forget, it, Greenberg, that was his name, and he he hid me this one time, and and this Texan was running up the street, to, and he knew what put the mother was, I'm sure, so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. It was, it was great. It was a, uh, and, and I went on to several years. Then I started, I graduated from Skid Row and went up to, uh, there's Maine and then Spring and Broadway and Hill and Olive. And, and I started going up towards the nicer areas and shiny shoes. And, and the cops every now and then would stop me, but I was never mistreated. Uh, uh, yeah, they'd pat me on the head and you know, I remember they'd warn me to look out. You know, there's some rough people around here. and. And sometimes the cops would buy me an ice cream or uh, give me a candy or something, but I was never uh, mistreated by the cops uh, at that age. So it sounds like there were there were other Mexican kids shining shoes. No, no, no. I never uh, in East LA. Yeah, I remember Memo Gorola, uh, but he'd hide his shine box when Barbara Kennedy came walking by. Memo Gorola's father was a, was a doctor. Dr. Miguel uh, uh, Gorola there on 4th and Soto. So he was, uh, Memo, I guess, was so-called elite, but he was one of the boys. Uh, there was uh, Memo and Pancho Arduino and Lane Lyle Nakano and, and uh, Max Factor, uh, who is not of the, the movie Max Factor, but, and uh, all three or four of us would uh, shine shoes in, in Boyle Heights. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was the only guy that went up to, uh, uh, downtown LA to, to shine shoes. In, in your book, you talk about the B girls. Are those bar girls? Is that yeah, what yeah. Uh, I'd go to the bars there and, yeah, on Main Street, and uh, sometimes they'd run me out, and other times uh, I like when the B girls would set me on their laps, and and, and uh, uh, they couldn't buy me a beer then, but uh, they treated me very well, and I'd run errands for them, make a nickel or so, and yeah, it was a great experience. Did you tell your parents about great experiences? No, I don't think I ever told them what I was doing during the day. They never asked me. Uh, on the south, you know, but I. You know. And how about your brothers here? They're good guys. Um, there's Art um, and uh, Sylvester, who we call him Tito. Uh, they were not renegades like I was. They, they just good guys. And, and Tito went into the Navy and uh, I think about 39, it was before the war. Uh, he was in, I remember he was in the CCC uh, thing, the, the camps they had, uh, and um, he was the older brother. And then Art went into the Navy in, uh, I think right after Pearl Harbor. And Teat was on the Lexington when they sunk it in the Coral Sea Battle in May the 8th, 1942, I believe it was. And Art was on, uh, a converted uh, yacht, it was a PY, the, uh, it would uh, look for Japanese submarines, uh, is a uh, horrible duty because, you know, I, I'm gonna jump several years. Uh, uh, when you, Art was on the PY 23, and the USS Farragut, I believe, and, and um, 
everywhere I went when I was in the Marine Corps, I'd always look for the PY-23. Naturally, in Pearl Harbor, there's hundreds of ships, and when I got there, I'd, naturally, every ship I saw, I'd look for the PY-23, and then we went to Hilo Harbor, and then uh, in Kwajalein, and then we talk, and, and then uh, Saipan, here we had hundreds of ships, uh, uh, and uh, then I got shot on, uh, I'm skipping a lot here, naturally, I, when, I, when I got wounded on Saipan, I was flown back to Hawaii to uh, Aia Naval Hospital, and they asked all of us who were wounded uh, uh, what, how we'd want to go back to the States. We could either fly back or get on a hospital ship. And I didn't want to take a chance of flying. I would much rather have flown back, but I thought maybe there'd be a long list uh, uh, waiting to uh, guys waiting to come back. So I chose a hospital ship. And uh, this to me is uh, impossible. I, uh, we're taking down, I was 18 at the time, I guess. And uh, had a big cast on my arm. I was shot in the ribs and one in the in the hand. And and um, we're aboard this hospital ship at Pearl Harbor. And we're standing there in chow line, waiting to shove off. And we're up on the top deck, and big line of guys waiting to go down below to eat. And and uh, I see this ship coming in, small ship. And uh, naturally, I'd look at uh, the the uh, uh, ID on it, and it was the PY-23. I said, I don't believe this, and pulled in right behind the hospital ship, and and I ran over to the rail, and there was a Navy chief was walking down the dock, and I, I say, Chief, I says, I says uh, my brother's on that ship. I says, uh, uh, would you please uh, uh, tell him that I'm here on, on this hospital ship? And I said, his name is Art. Back then, we used to use Gabaldon. I, was always, I thought that was our real name, it was Gabaldon. I didn't know it was Gabaldon until later in life. But anyway, I says, his name is Art Gabaldon. I says, uh, I says, please, tell him I'm here. He says, well, okay. So he nonchalantly walked in. I said, oh, my God. So he comes back and he says, well, they're busy tying up. And I says, hey, I'm leaving. I haven't seen him in years. I says, call him. So here comes, I see a little short guy, he's shorter than me, jump off of that ship and run down the dock. and. Uh, it was quite a touching reunion. We were both in tears. I was way up, looked like a thousand feet up on the, on the uh, top deck, and he's down on the dock. And and uh, he says, "Where are you going?" I said, "I'm going home." I said, "I don't know, San Francisco uh, or uh, Long Beach, San Diego." Uh, and uh, I say, "I says, you got any money?" Yeah, he says, "I says, uh, I got a lot of pay coming, but it's on the books." And and uh, and we talked a little bit, and then got ready to shove off, and he ran back to his ship, and they moved the, uh, the hospital ship off the dock. And I'll never forget, as we were going out, he's on, he's on the, uh, the, uh, the scope, they had a big scope on the deck there, and, uh, and he was sad, and after I was, uh, I've only been overseas a year and a half, I'm going home, he's been overseas three years, and still stuck on the little ship. And I got to San Francisco, and I looked up, uh, an uncle, and uh, uh, well, they turned us loose in the hospital. And I went out and got drunk, and I don't drink this thing, but I, I got drunk that that day. And and uh, next thing I know, I, I woke up back in, in the hospital. So I must have passed out on the street someplace, and I had a uh, blood was oozing out of the cast. And then anyway, they, uh, oh yeah, it was, it was bad. They, somebody had goofed. It turned black and it, it stunk. It actually, uh, I'm surprised there weren't maggots in there. I just had to keep my arm way out here so I couldn't smell it. Anyway, uh, I wake up uh, in the hospital and big hangover. Uh, like I said, I've never uh, been a, a boozer. But, so I called my uncle and, and uh, they picked me up, went to their apartment there in San Francisco. And they called relatives from all over, from Vacaville, from Sacramento and all. It was a big uh, party there making menudo and, and uh, chile rellenos and tortillas, my aunts and all. And, it, and all of a sudden my uncle says, hey guys, there's somebody watching on the phone here. And I said, well, who, who would know down there? And, and I grabbed the phone, my brother Art. While they were getting the mail aboard his ship, uh, after they pulled in behind mine, his orders were on, on there to come back to the States. So, I arrived one day before he did, and uh, so we got together another uh, 
meeting that I, I would think would be almost impossible. So I got, I got way ahead of myself here, but... <laughs> Um, let's go back a little bit to your childhood. In in your book, you refer to the Japanese family as your foster family. Was that just an expression? Well, they weren't legally. They didn't sign any papers, but I lived with them. I, I consider them my brothers, Lane and Lyle, uh, and Frank was the older brother. Lane and Lyle and I were the same age, or one year older than me. And uh, so I, I thought of them as my brothers. and. So I consider them foster. I don't know what other term I can give it. Than foster brothers. And your parents were okay with this? They yeah, and uh, they knew Lane and Lyle, and they knew uh, George Jr. and Kako Mochinaga and the rest of them, and uh, they never objected. They thought it was uh, perhaps they thought it was good for me. Then I started getting in trouble, and that's when my mom sent me to uh, to New Mexico. What kind uh, of you well, I started hanging out with the uh, tougher crowd. Uh, and my Japanese buddies were wondering, well, you know, how come you're leaving us to, to go with these other guys? There was, there was uh, that's where Max Factor come in, and Sully Factor, and uh, Harry Marsh, and uh, and Willie Archuleta, and and they were kind of rough guys. They were stealing cars, and and here I was 12 years old, riding in a hot car, and and Brady looked over the the uh, the, uh, the dashboard, and, and got picked up, and. I guess because of my extreme youth, I went to the juvenile hall for it was two weeks, and and my mom, my dear mother, she uh, she went to court, and she says, uh, please release him. Uh, I'll send him to New Mexico with relatives and so on, and they they released me, and uh, that's why uh, I went to New Mexico. And then when I came back, I went back with my old Japanese buddies. So I thank the good Lord, you know. Back then, there was no narcotics, there was no graffiti, there was no, uh, you, we'd fight, and you beat a guy up, he'd stand up, you shake his hand, and that was it. Today, it's a, it's another world. Why are you looking at me like that? You know, wham, you're dead, blow you away. Uh, so I, I say we lived in a good era. It was wonderful. I, I have fond memories of, of uh, El Barrio, and I go back there today, I go visit down then, and I can't get out of there fast enough. It's so depressing, what you see now, the graffiti and all. It's another way of life. Um, so you were driving when you were 12 years old? <laughs> driving brand new cars. <laughs> I remember Harry Marsh and I, we got on a freight train. I don't think I put this in my book. Uh, I didn't want my children to know, but now they're all growing up and married, and, I, and uh, I've told them, uh, this, Harry and I w got on the freight train out of the Montebello uh, UP yards, I think. Went to um, San Bernardino, uh, sold a car there. We drove over to Riverside, sold another car. And I had a brand new, maybe a year old, 1938 Chrysler. And we raced home, uh, Harry and I, back there, no freeways. And, and uh, yeah, 12 years old, barely look over to the, the, uh, the panel. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, I was driving to 12. And then when you went to New Mexico, then your uncle thought he was teaching you how to drive. <laughs> well, they knew, they knew what I had been doing, so they knew I could drive. And, and uh, my uncle Sam, Samuel Serna, uh, he had the, uh, the uh, post office. Uh, actually, he was the postmaster in San Rafael. And he'd have to drive to Grants every morning to pick up the mail bags. And I'd go with him. A little Model A Ford pickup. And uh, he'd let me drive, and and uh, I didn't realize what he had in mind. He finally uh, turned the whole thing over to me. And I, at uh, 12 years old, I was picking up the mail in Grants, and then he took me to, to the New Mexico DMV. I'd like to check the records on that, but I was 12 years old, and he got me my, my driver's license at 12. I think he told me I was 15 or 16 or whatever, but everybody there was compadres or primos, and. <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, why do you ask? Uh, I was driving at 12. I thought that was a natural thing to do. <laughs> now, uh, let's talk a little bit about, about your education, because you were in East L.A. and you were going to school. Yeah, I went to St. Mary's uh, for the four, first six years. Uh, is uh, great. The sisters were really fine. I, I, I think that's the only real education I ever had. And then, and then I went to Hollenbeck Junior High in East L.A. 
And then uh, I went to the best school in, in Los Angeles. People get a laugh at the old timers. I went to Andrew Jackson High School. That's a school for bad boys. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I, I, I give my talks all over here at Los Angeles. And, and uh, one time I was invited to, recently to, to Roosevelt High reunion. And everybody naturally thought I went to Roosevelt out from that area. And when I talk, I, says, uh, I went to Andrew Jackson. And this cracks him up. Uh, that was strictly for bad boys. I don't know if you ever heard of it. <laughs> it wasn't a reform school. It was just uh, uh, incorrigibles, I guess. Let me ask you this. When you were at St. Mary's in Hollenbeck, were, were, was it a mixed school or were... Uh, oh, yeah. That's why we didn't... I had never heard of the word pre prejudice until years later because in our area... Now it's, uh, I think it's about 90% Chicano. Back then, it, it, in our particular area, in Boyle Heights, there was, uh, there was more uh, Jews and Japanese than, than Chicanos. Um, I think in every block, there, especially on First and Mott, and uh, First and Soto in that area, I'd say in every block, that residential area, I'd say maybe one or two houses out of the block were Chicano, Mexicano. The rest were Japanese, a lot of Russians. The Russians were about four or five blocks away from this particular area where the Nakano family was down in the flats, they call that. Uh, a lot of Russians and Armenians. And mm, there was, La Raza was represented there, but there were more Russians than Armenians, and that, that was a real slum area. Yeah. But it wasn't a bad area. I mean, you, you know, a woman could walk down the street two in the morning and never worry about anything. Don't do it today, you say. Now, well, right after the war, it became more a black area. They had built uh, housing projects. When I was a kid, there were no housing projects. Uh, and they built housing projects in, uh, in that area. And there were a lot of blacks and a lot of rasa. And, and I think that's what it is today. The Japanese moved out, the Russians moved out. I married a Russian gal that I went to school with. Uh, we were 12 years old, uh, both of us. Uh, now when we got married, and we were in the seventh grade. And uh, she was from the flats. Uh, that group of Russians are known as the Malakans. Uh, comes from the word Malako. Malako is milk. Uh, they they would eat no meat. They're milk drinkers. Now they, and very prejudiced. Uh, very, they call us uh, Mexikansky Svinia or Americansky Svinia, American swine or Mexican swine. And, and I got to learn how to speak Russian. I, I ate borscht every day for 19 years, or every Sunday. My, my wife would make borscht, which uh, we like, and eclipsy, and just a lot of Russian chow. Yeah. So we had a strong Russian uh, uh, neighborhood uh, and Armenians. And the Armenians are, are uh, pretty sharp people. Uh, they didn't remain in the slum area very long. They, they, they had r rubbish routes, which was big money back then. Uh, the Armenians, uh, when the average guy was making, say, $35 a week or so, uh, I think that's, uh, I was too young and worked then, but uh, they'd be making uh, $1,000 a month. It was big money, big, big, big money then. So uh, prejudice, racism, racial problems, no. But with the Russians, but with the Russians... It I married one. <laughs> no, it, that was, uh, that's their religion, that's their way of life. If, uh, uh, they certainly objected to, they didn't talk to my wife for well over a year. Your family did not? Pardon? Your family didn't talk to your wife? Her oh, family. family her, yeah, the Russians. And... Uh, Oh, a year and a half or so, because we had our first child after he was born, and they, they said, come on over and all. And they, they were nice. They, they liked me. Uh, but uh, see, they, they were what they call themselves the pure Russians. The uh, Duhaburs in Canada are the same, same uh, people as the Molokans. And the Duhaburs, they, they were known to be very radical. They would object to... Uh, uh, anything uh, pertaining to the government or, or modernization of any kind. And then they'd strip the, uh, in, in, uh, 
in Vancouver, there were a lot of cases where the girls would walk naked down the street uh, uh, demonstrating against uh, modernization. And the Malacans were some of the, have this religion, uh, uh, that's where they call Malacan is their religion. And uh, uh, I remember my brother-in-law, he was in uh, one of their meetings, or, you know, hallelujah, jump up and down and all, and, and uh, he had his watch on, and, and the preacher ran over and grabbed the watch off his wrist and threw it against the wall because they're not allowed to have anything uh, of today. And uh, so they, they were prejudiced, but it wasn't racism like, like today. There was none of that. No. No, we uh, 12, 13 years old, being in an alley smoking a cigarette and passed from mouth to mouth. No one, no one ever thought of uh, uh, anything uh, like today. The white and the black aren't going to smoke the same cigarette. Or maybe they do, because we didn't have joints then. I don't know. <laughs> hey, how old were you when you started smoking? Pardon? How old were you when you started smoking? When you were oh, I guess uh, I wanted to be real macho, you know, maybe 11, 12 years old. And the worst thing I ever did, I quit about 30 years ago. And almost too late. Uh, and I'd advise uh, the youth of the day don't smoke. It's, uh, it has hurt my heart and my lungs and my eyes. and. I cracked up uh, at Long Beach International Airport one night. I was landing, in, uh, and I was, uh, to land is, is, is a stall, it's, uh, but you stall just three, four feet off the deck. And I thought it was, it was about two in the morning, and I thought I was next to the deck, and I stalled out. I was about 50 feet high and wiped out my airplane, and all attributed to smoking is affecting my eyesight. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was about 12 when I started. Tell me this, what, uh, switching gears a little bit, but what was your your uh, your memory of the Zoot Suit Riots? I forget, I think you mentioned that in the book, but I can't remember. Yeah, and I'm doing it, uh, incidentally, I've got another book. Uh, it's 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 finished, it's in the computer, and I'm just moving a paragraph here and there, and a uh, little editing, but uh, I go more extensively into the the uh, so-called Pachuco Zoot Suit uh, War. Uh, when I was in the Marine Corps uh, prior to going overseas, the uh, uh, Los Angeles was off limits. And I had my weekend liberty and I said, well, bull, uh, did, I'm gonna go home. <laughs> and he, uh, then uh, Marine just stepped out on the road and hitchhike and wham, you gotta ride right now. And I went back to LA and, and uh, uh, I was uh, worked over. Uh, in, by zoot shooters, but let me tell you something. It wasn't their fault. I, it was started, I did a lot of research on this, and it was typical uh, Texan, uh, uh, oaky type of sailors that uh, grabbed some pachucos, they had ankle chokers and a chain, and, and they worked them over. And uh, unbeknownst to, to these uh, anti-Mexican uh, Tejanos, a lot of those guys had just come back from from uh, Guadalcanal. These guys were, were vets at 18 years old, discharged for being wounded. And here they, they're beating up on them uh, for being uh, uh, zoot shooters. Uh, so uh, uh, I got I got worked over, but it was, uh, uh, certainly they didn't uh, realize that, uh, must have known I was a Chicano, but I was a Marine, I was in uniform. And uh, got my jaw broken. Yeah, I ended up in Long Beach Naval Hospital, which is the best duty I ever did while in the Marine Corps because uh, uh, they put uh, braces on or, or they wired my, my mouth closed. I was closed for two months and and uh, my uniform was all bloody, but so I, I used anybody's uniform my size and, I, and I'd, uh, Long Beach Naval Hospital was only 20 minutes away from East LA and half hour at the most. And, I'd hitchhike home every day, and and all these Russian gals at uh, the bowling alley. I, uh, I knew them from uh, from Boyle Heights, and and uh, and they were eager to uh, to serve their country by helping the servicemen, and I was enjoying it. And it was uh, two months of great duty. Yeah, I want to get my job broken again. Hey. Uh Mr. Gavazon, I have to ask you an, an discreet question, but you know, I was a reporter for many, many years, so that's that's where this comes from. But in your book, you describe several of these young women doing their patriotic duty. Did this entail going to bed with the soldiers, or was it just... You mean there's another way? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> 
Is that is that what was? Of course. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, I grew up watching all these movies where they don't ever go. People don't ever go to bed in those 1940s movies. All they do is. We weren't making movies. We were making babies. (laughs) Okay. Okay, Well, I just. That was a lot of fun. Um, You talk about about um, being called a spick when you were in Saipan by Virgil, whatever his name was. Oh, didn't, uh, yeah. yeah, I just came back. So I, I live in Saipan now. Okay. So when you said Saipan, okay. I, started, I was wondering, now, no, now. Uh, was uh, that a word that you, that you were familiar with? Oh, yeah. You mean you never heard that? Well, they don't uh, use it in tech. Actually, they don't they anymore, I guess. They don't really use spick. Oh, yeah, back then, spick uh, was very common. Spick, cholo, uh, synonymous with cholo. Uh, Oh, Mexican greaser. Uh, I don't know what call her greaser. My poor cousin, you know, she she's uh, from Grand Canyon, Mexico. And very fair. They uh, they're uh, uh, my dad's side, and and uh, and she was saying that uh, uh, she was called uh, she was called a Mexican greaser. There in school, there's a lot of prejudice in New Mexico, and and she says. Uh, I'm, oh, I, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not a Mexican. I'm a greaser or something like that. She didn't realize that how derogatory it was. But uh, uh, yeah, I was called a spick. Uh, this guy Virgil, Virgil Strong. I used to call him the Virgin. But uh, he, uh, you no, know, he showed it. Uh, I think the only guy. Uh, it was subtle with others, but he he showed he. Uh, he hated the Mexicans, and, and uh, I got back to him. You know, I killed, and I, I used to get a lot of sabers. I had 13 sabers and watches and stuff. Every, every Japanese I killed, and naturally I'd, I'd get the booty. Some people think that's wrong, but I I certainly don't. I mean, if I don't get it, the next Marine that comes by and sees that dead uh, Japanese soldier is going to get it. So anyway, I was always working on my own on Saipan. I, First time in Marine Corps history that a private worked on his own, and I'd go into Japanese territory and come back the next day with uh, prisoners or or booty, and and uh, so I was very seldom with my outfit, uh, the Second Marine Division, uh, uh, Second Marine Regiment uh, Intelligence Unit, and uh, I came back to my outfit one time. They were on the east side of Saipan, and there was a little stream that. Uh, uh, came out of a cave, and and boy, this was rare. I, and I hadn't showered or bathed in, in a month, and and so man, I see the stream, and I and I go jump in there, took my clothes off, and jumped in the, the stream. And the other Marines were not everybody was using the stream to, to bathe in, but uh, there was only one guy there, a guy very strong, and he and I were standing there naked, and and I'm watching. I said, you know. I says, uh, somebody stole my, my sabers and all my booty. I says, but I'm going to kill the son of a bitch. I, said, I know who did it. I'm going to kill him tonight. He knew I'd been killing every day. And, and that evening, my sabers were back. So he, I guess he realized that perhaps I would have killed him. Uh, it wouldn't have made any difference to me. Uh, now, as part of the thing about the, the booty, is that is that like evidence that you've killed? that, that no, I didn't get it for evidence. I get it because I, I like to have sabers. Uh, I had a, I had a 32 uh, uh, Browning Patton 32 uh, shoulder holster, and uh, the only guy that ever had it. And uh, I just got a letter the other day from uh, Don Jones, uh, who uh, was with the uh, U.S. Embassy in uh, Islamabad, Pakistan. And he refers, he says that that cocky little marine. He says with that 45 the shoulder holster, it was a, it wasn't a 45 at all. See the when Nazi Germany took over Belgium, why they took over everything, and there was a, a Browning uh, arms manufacturing plant, and the Japanese officers ended up with uh, Browning Patton 32s. So one guy I killed had had one, and I and I was uh, wore that. That was that's booty. Uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't get to prove anything. The first time I've ever heard that. I, I didn't give it. Didn't give that a thought. I got it because it was mine, and uh, 
I have more booty than anybody else uh, that I know of in, in, in the second main division. But, um, Let me ask you something, because uh, I think that you mentioned something about gold teeth also in your book, and other people have also said in, in Oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of things carry little, uh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the old tobacco, you when you roll the cigarette, the, what, what was it called? Uh, Bodum, yeah. And uh, uh, a lot of Marines would uh, have these little bags and, and carry flyers, and when they killed the Japanese, the Japanese had a lot of gold teeth. And off came the gold teeth in a bag. And what happened to those teeth afterwards? Well, I don't know. Maybe they made a necklace, or maybe they sold them, or they worth some money. But, but uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I guess it sounds very gory, uh, very unethical. But uh, on the other hand, what's that dead person going to do with the gold teeth? We're going to bury them the, the way we we used to get. Uh, they they use. Uh, 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 bulldozers uh, uh, cut a trench and just bury all the bodies, and so there goes the gold teeth and perhaps watches and everything else. Why not take it? Uh, got a letter a while back from, from a guy in Saipan just recently, and uh, yeah. um, later. Can you come back later? Later. Uh, so anyway, I I don't know what each individual did with his gold teeth. Uh, I imagine a lot of it ended up in a pawn shop, perhaps. Did you, did you get gold teeth too? What did you say? Did you get gold teeth too? I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm hard of hearing. Yeah, right. I'm getting old. Right. You, you, um, a little bit about about the your your exploits. Um, I saw the, the tape and I read the book, and that's an awful lot of people, 800, or I guess more than 800 on that one. On that one. You know, something happened just recently on this. First of all, I never counted them. I could, couldn't count them. Uh, if you saw the tape, you, you saw my former commanding officer, Colonel John Schwabe, and there was uh, Colonel Walter Layer, uh, who was, uh, uh, he was uh, active duty when we were on this in your life, and it was uh, 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 Major High and uh, Lloyd Hurley and uh, James Gilmer. These are Marines from, from combat, fellow Marines, that uh, uh, John Schwabe says, officially I captured 1,500 Japanese, I had no idea. And Major High, in front of, I guess there's 40 million people watching, said that he was there when I brought these prisoners in, uh, 800 in one day. And uh, just recently, you know, I, I've got shoe boxes full of letters, those that read my, my book. Uh, I'll get back to this 800, but when I, read, when I wrote my book, I said, you know, there's going to be a lot of flack. There's going to be a lot of sour grapes, I'm sure. This kind of held me back. I heard Marines going to say, hey, I was there too, you know, who are you? And, and let me tell you, not one negative letter. I've got letters that you see the tear stains on the letters. Guys like uh, maybe in uh, in the hospital, VA hospitals, uh, dying or whatever, TB or whatever, and uh, saying thanks, guy, you brought back memories. Or others say, uh, I remember when you killed those those three Japs. The Japs was the word that was used when you kill those three Japs and in that sister. And another guy say, I remember you bringing in a uh, whole mess of Japanese. Didn't say how many, fifty or hundred, two hundred. Yeah, so uh, uh, not not one one negative till just recently. A guy here in Washington D.C. called me. Says, oh, "I'd like to interview you on the phone." I said, "Okay." Doyle, Mike Doyle, maybe you know him. Uh, he sounds from the the B. That's uh, where I live in Modesto. It's the B. It's uh, Sacramento B, Modesto B, and Fresno B. Yeah, and that's fine. So he said, he said, you know, I can't find anything in, in the Marine Corps official records uh, of over 200 Japanese being taken. He said, you claim you took 800. I said, I don't claim anything. I said, others claim it for me. And uh, I remember that uh, I used to wonder at times who was a prisoner. I was in among hundreds of Japanese who were my prisoners. Uh, they, they would have made uh, Chikano Sashimi out of me. I had killed two or three, and that would have been the end of it. But uh, 
so it's always so fine. So he had a review about it. Oh, it must have been close to two hours on the phone. And he says, we're doing a, a deal for Memorial Day. And well, we were laying in bed last Sunday, Johan and I, uh, I said, go get the paper and, and front page and the B. Here it is. Oh, I see, you got a copy. I had you. Uh, uh, anyway, it starts off good. Did you see it, uh, Maggie? Charlie, Charlie mentioned that there had been some... Oh, the, half, the first half is beautiful. And here's a guy going to the caves and killing and capturing and so on. And then he said, on the flip side. I said, wow, what's the flip side? And he says, the Marine Corps does not back my, uh, my claim. I said, well, you know, uh, how do you fight the press? I can't holler at the newspaper, what claim? I mean, the guys, uh, uh, newspapers can kill. Uh, uh, yellow journalism can kill you. And there, there was, uh, here, I'll go back a little bit. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley is known to be very racist, uh, anti-Mexican. Uh, we're all wet back uh, fruit pickers, and that's all we are. To, it's a lot better now than they tell me 50 years ago. But uh, so I said, oh my God, I said, Hanna, read this. I said, geez, uh, you know, I, uh, I think I told you on the phone, I said, call me anything, call me a son of a bitch, call me anything you want, but don't call me a liar. And I had a lot of problems in Saipan when I first went there, but I ended up being the chief of police intelligence, the governor's my compadre, and, uh, and the people, uh, they give me a lot of honors there. And they, they, I'm the only American, stateside American, that was made a, a citizen of, of the Commonwealth. And, and, but the first few years, but they never touched my military record. He called me a troublemaker because I was hitting the corruption in government. And, you know, it doesn't endure you to the, the, the ends. And, but no one ever hit me on my military record. And I figured, do anything you want, call me, like I say, a son of a bitch, uh, uh, arrogant or whatever. But don't call me a liar. And they don't, hit, don't try to hit me on my military record. And, and this is the first time I've been hit. And I, I took it hard. I'm still taking it hard. And I'm trying to fight back. My attorney's on it, and he wants to sue. And uh, so many people are, are on this thing. Yeah, friends of mine, guys, it's, I, I got calls and letters that say, Jesus, God, we saw you bring him in. Why did this, this guy do that? And then I was going through my, my, uh, my files just before coming here, uh, looking for material to fight what this guy did to me. And I ran across one article, a full-page article. I've got it here. I'll show it to you in a minute full page article about the commander, the naval commander of Saipan after the war, come out with the actual figures, it was I think 9,000 Japanese holdouts. And this guy said in that paper 200 Japanese were taken prisoner. And my, and my commander in this life says, he says, uh, Sergeant York did a great thing and he got the Medal of Honor and he well deserved it. He said, but what Gabaldon did was 10 times more. I think uh, uh, Sergeant York got 120. Uh, so anyway, you asked me about the 800. Uh, the movie, they, they, that's movie stuff. He, oh, he mentions the movie. And even my command officer says they, the embellishment of, of Hollywood. Uh, and and I, I mentioned my, in my uh, rebuttal to this guy in, in the B, I say the movie was a, a lot of crap. I say, I feel honored that I was chosen to have a movie made in my life, but it's Hollywood. And we all know what Hollywood is. I don't care whose life they make, it's not gonna come out true to life. But I, I still feel that, uh, uh, my good Lord, man, I'm the only enlisted Marine who had a, a movie made of his life. And now the next movie, I'm, I want to uh, make sure that it's uh, authentic. So that's, that's the 800. Because I, I think that you, you say this in your book, that um, one of the, the uh, you think that one reason that you've been passed over for the, the Congressional Medal of Honor is because you are Latino. Of course. Of course, there's no doubt about it. And uh, I'm trying to get Schwabi to, to admit this. Uh, you know, he's still alive and he's gonna go any day. He's at 81 or so. And, and but uh, uh, of course it was because I'm a Chicano. No other reason. 
I had the highest IQ in, in, the, in the intelligence outfit I was in, R2, regional intelligence. I didn't know this, but uh, the, the, the clerk uh, who has all the records, a guy named Richard Ofringa, um, he just died in New Jersey. He's been writing to me, and, and he says, yeah, and one of his letters, he says, guy, he says, I told Schwab, he says, he says, this little kid we got here, he says, he's going places. And uh, he told me, he says, you know, guys, you had the, you had the highest IQ, and, and I came out of PFC, man. The guys that I had seniority on, for no other reason than just seniority, uh, when, when, the, when they did This Is Your Life, uh, Ralph Hurdens had a party for us after the, the program at uh, Roosevelt uh, Hotel in, in Hollywood. And um, then there was uh, Colonel Schwabe, Colonel Layer and the rest of them. Uh, so we sat around boozing and and uh, till the wee hours of the morning. And and one guy there, I, I don't, I forget who it was, says, Colonel, he says, why was Guy never promoted? And I'll never forget. I said, hey, I want to hear this. So Shabby says, he says, well, you know, he says, interpreters uh, had a rank of no less than sergeant. So. He says Gabaldon was going to get sergeancy, so I so I didn't promote him when the promotions came up because why promote him to a corporal when he's going to get sergeancy? That sounds logical, but you know what, Maggie? I was not an interpreter. My MOS was scout and observer, and I didn't. I, I right then I could have said bullshit, uh, Schwabi. Uh, you knew I was not an interpreter, and yet yet he said he o he overlooked me or, or passed me by because I was going to get sergeancy. That's not the truth. I didn't get. I, I didn't even get corporal out of it. That's all right. My son was in the Marine Corps. He come out uh, a gunnery sergeant or something. And uh, nowadays, is well, my son's half Russian, so you know he's whiter than I am. Let's say. Um, and nowadays, there isn't that prejudice in the corps as there was back then. See, the corps. That's another thing this guy did in this uh, this report. This uh, the guy from the B. He states in there, he says, and, and guy says the Marine Corps was a bunch of rednecks. Hey, that's out of context. That's unfair. What I told him, I says, before the war, the Marine Corps was a bunch of rednecks who were tough sons of bitches who did well. They fought in China. They fought in Nicaragua and all. I said, I'm proud of them. I said, but they were a bunch of rednecks. All he says there, he didn't say that. I said they were a bunch of tough guys. He says, guy says the Marines consisted of a bunch of rednecks. That's not fair. That's yellow journalism. How do you fight? How do you fight the press? You tell me, man. How does a, a lowly Chicano, a nobody, fight the press? I've been writing every day. I've been writing to the editor. Why? I've been hitting them with some real good stuff. I said, I said, damn it. I says, well, let's have a little fair play. I says, submit these letters. You, you got four guys, three that I never heard of, and they said they're not fans of mine. So uh, I don't care if they're Marine Corps or not. He said, "Now, fans of mine, the, the rest is going to be negative." The one guy he mentioned, Bosco, that said he was with me in the Marine Corps. Bosco went up for cowardice, and I want the editor to get a hold of Schwabi before he dies to verify that. See, Bosco, after the war, he was just a, another corporal or so. And after the war, he showed up in my place in Los Angeles. Uh, I was going to school then under the GI Bill. I think I was getting $120 a month. Had a wife and a, and a kid, and man, my brother was staying with us. And, and here comes Bosco, comes knocking on my door. He's from Altoona, Pennsylvania. And he said, hey, guys, I thought I'd come to California. I'd like to move over here. I said, well, I said, okay, you can bunk with us for a little bit. After two months, I had to kick him out. I said, hey, man, I said, I, said, I can't afford to keep you. I'm getting $120 a month on GI Bill. and. Uh, yeah, so I, I kicked him out, and so when he was inter interviewed, he come back and he says, all, all guy got was a bunch of old men and women or something like that. And I figured, you son of a bitch. You know? Yes, it is. Why would Schwabi lie about this? Why would he... He lie about what? You no, know, he verifies yeah, that I captured... Yeah, he said that he, that he, wanted, he thought that you were going to make it to... I don't know. I, I don't know. I like Schwabi. And he was an enlisted man's officer. Everybody liked him, man. And not all officers are like enlistment. He, he was a good guy. He, was, he, was, he must have been only 25 at the time he was a captain. And, and uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe 
He just had no comeback. I mean, why was I discharged of PFC? Yeah, I mean, on seniority alone, on my IQ alone, not anything I may have done in battle. Uh, you know, I was the only Chicano in the outfit. I'll tell you a story. The guy named Alfredo, this is uh, in my in my book now. Uh, Todavía no, ¿por qué no dan la vuelta, Hanna? Otro 15, 20 minutos. We'll wait them down there. Ok. Don't you think that it's hot? Sí, pero Hanna, por favor, estamos, está, está grabando ahorita. You did it. Uh, yeah, maybe it is. Oh. I'm fine. I'm comfortable. Are you Are comfortable? You? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We're fine. Hi. Really, I thought you were Maggie. <laughs> anyway, Maggie. this guy, I, was, uh, I worked on my own. Uh, first time in military history, first time in military history that, that a private worked on his own. And uh, I went over the hill the first time. We just landed in Saipan. And uh, as it states on this, your life, uh, Hurley, <coughs> Hurley and I hit the beach together and bullets all over, guys falling, dying, and, and I saw my, going ashore, like everybody, I was 18 years old, and, well, kill all the dirty Japs, we're gonna, these monkeys hanging from the trees, and you see, the Americans didn't know what Japanese were before the war, and uh, so, going across Beach Road, it's a, now it's a beautiful paved road, it's just a dusty coral road, and so the beach is only, oh, maybe, 50 feet from the water to the road, and we hit the, the deck there as we landed and then ran across the road. And I, I see that the first time I saw a dead Marine. I saw guys fall, but this guy had a neat little hole in his head, and the blood had caked, his helmet was off. And uh, naturally with this dust and the blood flowing, I had just caked on it. So I froze. I looked at him and I says, my God, just 15, 20 minutes ago, or a couple hours ago, we were aboard ship before coming, and we're all talking about our girlfriends, our our high school or whatever back home. And this guy, he's another 18-year-old Marine dead. <clears throat> I couldn't understand it. <clears throat> Just a few minutes prior to that, come on, we're gonna go kill macho and all. All of a sudden, I'm, I froze. And you know, people say, were you scared? I said, I don't know. I don't know how scared, I just said, what am I doing here? I belong back at the bowling alley with all those young chicks. <coughs> Pardon me. And um, I heard he says, he says, get your ass on down here, man. And the boat's flying around. That's why sometimes I wonder, was I scared? If I was scared, I would have hit the deck. You know, the, the Japanese shooting at machine guns and everything. So he, he grabs me. He says, he had already dug his foxhole and pulled me down in, with him. Well, uh, I soon got over that, and I mean, immediately within hours, I was over that. So I went over the hill into Japanese territory and came back with a few prisoners. <clears throat> Schwabi says, Schwabi's never a mean guy. He says, he says, don't you ever do that again. He says, this is teamwork. This is the Marine Corps. He says, you don't fight on your own. He says, you're, gonna, you're not a prima donna, and you're going to take orders. So I said, Yes, sir. That night I loaded my pocket with ammunition. I went back in Japanese territory. I come back with about 50 prisoners. And Shrabi says, wow. He says, let the little jerk go. He says, he's doing a job. So I, that was, I was on my own. I was freelance. I said, I don't believe this. An 18-year-old Chicano, eighth grade dropout. I'm on my own. So uh, during the day, I'd, I'd nap there and a bunch of Marines around all taking care of me. I said, geez, I got... I got good babysitters here, you know, and, and nighttime, I, I guess I was uh, like a, a Dracula. At nighttime, I'd come alive and go for blood, and I'd go back in Japanese territory, come back with prisoners. So then I, I never knew where I was going to come back, <clears throat> because I'd, I'd zigzagging in Japanese territory, I might end up, I was in the 2nd Marine Regiment of the 2nd Marine Division, but the 4th Marine Division was also there. And each division, a reinforced wartime division, 22,000 men. Peacetime is about 13,000, 14,000. And there was a 27th Army Division. There's three divisions across the island. So I'd end up with 
I don't know who was on your fourth division or my second division, maybe not my outfit, maybe the eighth Marines or the sixth Marines or the, there was a tenth and the fourteenth and the eighteenth. And uh, so, uh, like Shabby states in his recommendation from the Honor, he says, he says, Gabaldon started uh, bringing in uh, more prisoners in such great number that our uh, our facilities could not handle them, so we sent them to other other units. And uh, Gabaldon would come into uh, to the American lines in, in, uh, to units that were not of our own. So anyway, that's how they they have no numbers on on my my prisoners. So this one time, I, I guess about maybe D plus five or some few days after the day, uh, I'm out alone out hunting. Uh, either, uh, I went out to kill or capture, and, and uh, I bumped into three Marines. They were they were pinned down by a Japanese machine gun, and from a, a bunker. And that bunker's still there. It's in a Japanese park on, on Middle Road in Saipan. And there was a big gully, a ravine, uh, just across the dirt road. Now it's been filled, and there's a, the Taosu store is there. My wife goes there all the time shopping. And they, but anyway, I bumped into the three Marines in, in this ravine. And I said, what the goddamn hell are you guys doing here? This is my turf. I, I thought it was all my turf in Japanese territory. And uh, one of them was Chicano. And, Hey, so the Japanese firing at us, but they can't hit us because it's going right over our heads. And so we had talked, I said, hey, where are you from, man? And he says, uh, Los Angeles. I said, so am I. I said, where about this? Maravilla. I said, oh, I saw from Boyle Heights. He said, okay, let's fight. And he didn't joke with me naturally. And his name is Alfredo. So uh, he said, no. Talking uh, very little because we're in action, and and uh, he pulls out a Bible. Back then, the Marine Corps issued the, the New New Testament, oh, pocket size, and it didn't surprise me. I've seen other Marines do that uh, under fire, and he opens it up, puts it back in his pocket, and he he grabs his uh, M1. And he jumps up to go over the uh, the edge of this uh, ravine, and we all three were told to hit the deck, you crazy bastard! And they get him, boy. The pieces fly off his head. Well, first of all, he pulls a grenade off his belt and pulls a pin. You know, you can hold a spoon, you can hold it for an hour, you can hold it all day, but you let that spoon go, and you got five seconds, and it's gonna blow up. So he pulled a pin. We always used to do this. We pull a pin and hold it, and and then count one, two, three, and toss it. And uh, because if you don't do that, they can catch it and throw it right back at you. So he, he pulls a grenade off his belt, throws his M1 down, and uh, before he jumps over, he decides to watch Okana. And uh, he's a crazy son of a bitch. And he gets it, man. They hit him. You know, looking over the edge. and chunks of his head going in his body, just, they, hundreds of rounds, not just, these are machine guns, the Nambu, the Nambu 25, 6.5, uh, you could tell, after two or three days in battle, you know the difference between the 7.1 and 6, where they sound different, dot, 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 and brrr, and so he gets it with the, uh, the 6.5, yeah, blowing him apart, he goes down, the grenade goes off, blows his arm off, he couldn't feel anything after he's dead, you know, so this is, this is the way the, the Chicano Marine fought. Now, one Marine Chicano World War II got the Medal of Honor. This guy gave his life for me and two other Marines. We didn't even know each other. He, he, he saved our lives because and so when he did that, I took off to the left, went around the ravine, went back behind the, the park. It was even a park then. Japanese had a coin, they call it a park. And these other two guys, they took off. And since then, for years, I, was, I tried to find out what officer they were from. I don't know if they were the 4th Division, the 2nd Division, I don't know what regiment. But here was a guy named Alfredo, uh, never knew his last name, gave his life for three other Marines. No Medal of Honor. No record. There's one that you know, who's going to recognize a guy that some stupid bastard that, that died for God and country. You so see? Do you do you think that that maybe uh, the the Congressional Medal of Honor? Do you think maybe that's because you were um, a lone wolf 
Do you think that just... No, 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 no. Lone Wolf is, is an action that stories are made of, movies are made of. No, no, quite to the contrary. That didn't, that didn't hold me back. No, it was... You know, I hate to use a race, crowd, a race card. I'll tell you why. In, I don't know, uh, your background uh, uh, or your wife's background is from Mexico. My background, you know, we say, I was introduced by Colonel Tejas at uh, Mount Bell Park last Memorial Day. And he says, Colonel Tejas says, we're proud to be Mexican and be Latinos. And, and here's this guy, Galvaldon, who did this. And he did his homework because he read my book and he mentioned lots of things from the book. And then I got up to him and I said, you know, and the crowd is all Mexican-American. I said, you know, I said, I'm not Mexican. I'm not Latino. I said, I'm Chicano. And boy, they, they love this. And, they, you know, we're a race of our own. We're a breed of our own. I don't, it's hard to get this over, I guess. Maybe you won't understand this. I mean, Texas is right next to Mexico. And, you know, I didn't know anything to, about Mexico. I think uh, Charlie can verify this. We went down to La Paz, and, and they were another people. Until I married this girl, I lived in Mexico. I said, "Geez, I didn't know what Cinco Mayo was." We, 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 uh, there was Babe Emmanuel Paulin. Uh, there was uh, Mundo. Um, oh, uh, so uh, our little gang there in, in East LA. I say gang. There were no gangs back then. Our crowd. But you know what? None of us knew anything about Mexico. Nothing. It's not like today. My children, who are half islanders, and the other, uh, my other, uh, my first wife, they're half Russian. They know Mexico. And me, that I'm full-blooded Mexican from from Mexican parents whose ancestors came from Chihuahua. I know nothing. I knew nothing. I know now. I knew nothing about Mexico. You had to teach yourself. Yeah, I, well, I learned by accident. I went down and lived down there. I started a business down there. And my wife is, uh, like Ohana says, the only time she realizes that she's Japanese is when she looks in the mirror in the morning. She, you know, we got two kids who are born Cinco de Mayo. The mm -hmm. so first one was by accident. The second one, I always say this like your talk, I says the second one, I said, Ohana, now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, <laughs> we, we have two born Cinco de Mayo. And uh, how, how much, in Mexico. Let's see, Tony and Yosha, both in Mexico. Because we got three born in Mexico and two born in, in uh, one born in New Mexico, one born in Los Angeles. Uh, so I became very Mexicanista. You know, I used to be, they called me a right wing radical. I didn't know what right wing was. I didn't know what conservative was. Uh, but I was born a conservative. I was born, a, uh, I look back now, I was, I was born a right winger, but I didn't know what right winger was. Now I, I realize, okay, right winger, you must hate Jews, you must hate blacks, you must hate Mexicans. Yeah. But I am anti-gay uh, rights. I don't know how you feel about it. You, you're a professor, uh, well educated and all. And nowadays in the universities and in the, in the the students as well as the faculty, I say, oh, they're born that way. I don't feel that way. I'm strong. I feel very strong about it. It's an abomination unto the Lord to, to quote the Bible. But I feel, what a, how low can a human being get for, to quote the Bible again, for man to lie down with man is an abomination. And so this makes me, all of a sudden, I'm a right-wing radical because I, I, I object to, to uh, homosexuality. Uh, I object to uh, 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 women's lib. I, I object to uh, 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 abortion, right to abortion. And so then I'm supposed to be a knee-jerk, knee uh, Republican, conservative, right-winger, radical. And it's not the case. Let me ask you this guy. Um, going back to your mechanismo, you say that you used to pronounce your name Gabaldon. I was born and raised, I don't know why my parents, because they're from New Mexico, it's Gabaldon. It was always Gabaldon, I didn't know it was anything else. Did you speak I, Spanish at the home? At home? Very little, I'd say maybe half and half. Um, not very much, because we didn't learn, 
uh, oh boy, you know, we didn't learn Spanish. We naturally, we were there in the influence of uh, the body. You always pick something up. But I made some horrible mistakes because I didn't know Spanish. One time in, in uh, we lived in Ensenada for 10 years. I had a flying operation there. And, and uh, a guy was, a mechanic was working on my car. And he was a, he was a motorcycle cop there in, in Ensenada. And he had a, a mechanic shop. He was working on my car. And, and he said, I need a car of I says, I said, hey, I says, no seas tan pendejo, de, apurate. He got out there with, he had wrenches in. And I said, what, what are you so mad about? I know, no, I said, no, I said, no, I didn't know in Mexico you don't say that. You say that, you're, you're asking for trouble, or asking to get your head blown off. Well, see, this is how little I knew about. Even today, Ohana says, no, I said, yes, I said, And then the New Mexico people, they say, they don't say, I see. They'd say, no, I said, yes, 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 Put your jacket on. Let's go to the post house. Stop at the, you know. So, so here I was raised in this atmosphere, and uh, the New Mexico people always said they're Spanish, you know, Spanish. Uh, and like Mimi was telling me, she said, you know, guy, that's been such an embarrassment to our movement. She says the New Mexico people have. And I says, why? Well, I mean, she says, why do they? She says they keep insisting they're Spanish. And I remember one time when I was a. Uh, uh, Young kid there uh, visiting my grandfather on my mom's side in San Rafael says, I'm uh, a familia mexicana aquí ahora that just moved into San Rafael. And I said in English, they all spoke English except my grandfather, my uncle's and aunts. And I said, There's a Mexican family here on, in San Rafael. I said, Aren't we all Mexican? He said, No. No, they said, But not in a way of prejudice or superiority. The, I never saw that. But they said, no, no, they, they fry bananas, they eat corn tortillas, uh, they say different words. And I said, oh, my God. So that's why in my book I speak of the, the beautiful heritage we have from the Spaniards that came in, for, in 1539, I believe it was, that conquered, whether they were right or not, uh, that conquered the Indians and all. We have a beautiful heritage. But then, coming back to... Marrying Ohana and living in Mexico, I made a lot of money in Mexico, much. And I don't owe it to Mexico. I'll tell you why. I went down to Bahia Los Angeles, a little 172, I had a little smaller airplane, a 170. And just part of that, in the pause, I, when Charlie went with me, they had what they call cocktail de almeja. And, Nice little cocktail of uh, the, uh, the cayo, cayo de, de almeja that he uh, uh, put tomato sauce or tomato ketchup and, and lemon and chili and whatnot. And, and somebody told me, he says, hey, guy, you know, that's scallops. The Mexicans don't know that scallops. They call it almeja, a clam. Eh, that didn't make uh, much difference to me. Later on, I was flying some people from New York, from uh, from San Francisco, the, the Levi Strauss family wanted to get in on buying shrimp. So I flew them down to Guaymas and got them a good deal with a co-op there. See, no one can work shrimp in Mexico. No one can work, uh, not even a Mexican can work shrimp as an individual. It's co-op, cooperativas. And abalone, langosta, shrimp, uh, mero, and a few other species. And, but not almeja. Almeja was open, so... I tell these, uh, these people from San Francisco, I says, you want some, uh, some uh, uh, scallop? I said, I can get you scallop. And wow, they jumped right on it. So I flew him over, I flew this one guy. Um, uh, he was the mayor's nephew, mayor of San Francisco, that Italian name. Uh, uh, oh, anyway, uh, he was trying to be the big wheel, so he peels out $10,000 $10, and going to impress people. But, so I got him a load of scallop. And I got stuck with it. He skipped out of La Paz. I just thought it wasn't worth it. I said, oh my God, man, what am I going to do with this load of scallop? So I got a hold of Charlie Cervantes, who owned uh, Aero Carga. He, he'd been freighting in, in C-46s to, to La Paz. And I said, Charlie, would you help me out? I got this, this scallop. I said, I got to get up to Ensenada real fast or it's going to spoil on me. So I had it in, in a freezer in La Paz. And uh, 
So he flew it up and geez, I made a bundle. And man, it's all right. And Mexico doesn't know that this is a, a good product. So I went down, I, did, I started working it and flying it up and I bought an, another airplane, a bigger airplane and then a bigger one and, and I was rolling the money. So I figured, so I started looking for uh, banks of scallop and I went to Bahia de los Angeles and I found a, the world's biggest bank there. So I, I'll tell you why I say I don't thank Mexico. The guys who are working in Bahia de los Angeles are getting one dollar a day. One dollar and 120 degrees, just like Mexicali down in, in the Gulf. And I taught them to dive. They end up making $60 a day with me. Oh boy. Should I take a message? I'm, I'm stuck with the mic. <laughs> Hello? Ah, uh, no, this is uh, someone who's a guest of theirs. Can I take a message? He is, but he's busy right now. Can I take a message? Frank Hamidas. Oh, yeah. Can I? Okay, hang on one second. Okay. Can you follow me? Hang on one second. Okay, that's, hang on. Oh. There you go. Well, I'm on you where you go, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rest my hand there. <laughs> you want me to take over here? No, that's all right. Just start with El Coronel Galdon and watch my airplane for me. <laughs> it was a borrowed airplane. <laughs> you know, you know, I tailed it back. But I, they made me a coronel in Mexico. Oh, okay. In the Los Dorados. My, my compadre Aniceto Lopez Salazar was the jefe. He actually wrote a punch for me. He was an old guy then. Uh, and uh, very tough, tough guy. But anyway, let's see. Um, uh, when you change, uh, yeah, when okay. you changed uh, Gabaldon, Perfect, yeah. you started using Gabaldon. What is, that oh, that, well, that's a, in um, in Mexico. When I started going down there, I, then I realized it was Gabaldon. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I prefer Gabaldon. Uh, I remember my daughter, she says, boy, she, uh, she went to, graduated from UCLA. Uh, uh, she's half Russian. She committed suicide in San Diego a couple of years ago. But um, she says, Dad, she says, I like the accent on the last syllable, Gavaldon. They became very Mexicanistas, you know. But, uh, and I tell you about the blowfish, uh, continue with what I was saying. Uh, I, uh, these guys were making a dollar a day there with uh, Antero Diaz. He, he was a cacique. He's the guy that started making a dollar a day working in a mine there at uh, Baya de los Angeles. And he had a bright idea one time. Americans would land there, the landing strip, and he got a couple of drums of gasoline and he'd sell. Because back then the light airplanes couldn't make it to La Paz, didn't have the range. So anyway, he did well on that and, and he grew and, and built a resort there and, and did very well. But still, he was paying his men a dollar a day. And I ended up teaching these guys how to dive and get the uh, scallop. And they made a lot of money, lots of money. And uh, I ended up with seven airplanes and 22 boats and $1,000 a day in my pocket, net, net, net. And you know, just rolling money. One of the biggest compliments, the best compliments I ever had was a guy named Gorino in, in Ensenada. He said, oh, you guy, he's a, one of the Spaniards that came right after Franco or during the, the, the Civil War. And uh, uh, Basco. And he says, his guy, he says, Tienes tanto dinero. I said, mucho dinero. Tienes un Toyota que tiene agujeros, you know, the rust and all. He says, y vives una vida muy espartico. And I thought, yeah, I look back and I said, what a compliment. That to me meant that it didn't go to my head. And I, I was net, net, net a thousand dollars a day. I'd see an airplane I like, write out a check. I bought a nice yacht. Uh, it was a, it was a tug. I made, I made uh, a yacht out of it. I had a uh, wet bar and, and refrigeration. And all. I'd go traveling thousands of miles in it. And I, I said, I, I, I can thank God. You know, born in the barrio, eighth grade dropout, didn't know anything, just a lot of huevos, and that's all. And I went out and I, and I said, I'm making a lot of money. I don't have the money now, but uh, uh, anyway, I taught these guys to dive for the uh, scallop. And uh, uh, now, like I say, I, don't, I can't thank Mexico itself for this, because after Mexico, when they found out the scalp was 
worth a lot of money, and I was making money. I saw the writing on the wall. They, just, they stopped the, they said, well, we're gonna stop the operation temporarily. And I told Ohana, I said, let's get out. We sell our airplanes and ships and go. Because I told Ohana, I said, if I last one year, I'll be happy. I last 10 years. Uh, not 10 in the scallop, but making money. And so, uh, Later, I'd fly back to Bahia Los Angeles. Uh, her brother lives there now, and and, uh, and people say, "Guy, come back! These are the people from the villages there. They come back." I said, I "Can't your government won't let me? The government, uh, the socialist government of Mexico, whether we like it or not, it's socialist. They squeeze the people. They offer them the cooperativas and all this bull." and they break them, the people live in poverty. They wanted me to go back. So that, that's why I say, the people, even, even the people there do not thank their government for the money they're making, they thank me. You see? Hey, Guy, um, I told this though, where does the name Guy come from? Oh, I, I didn't baptize myself, I don't know. But uh, my, my mom and dad tell me that a neighbor of theirs, his name was Guy, Guy Wilson or something. And, uh, that um, his namesake, they baptized me guy. Uh, like I said, it's as good a story as any, I don't know. They, where, where does Margarita come from? <laughs> Mary Magdalene, it's Mary Magdalene. Really? Yeah. And, I, and my mother told me years ago that it came from, she wanted to call me Maggie, and that came from a soap opera that she would watch. But now she says that that's not true. So, <laughs> who knows? Um, Overall, how did World War II change your life? Charlie changed my life. Really, seriously, honestly. Charlie changed my life. Damn him. I had to shoot him. <laughs> <laughs> they, you know, that's a good question. Sometimes I say, I wish they'd never made a movie in my life. So, uh, I got a lot out of it, and, and yet, I don't know. I was happy being a truck driver. Uh, I bought a home in Downey, just making, I was a line driver, it's supposed to be the prima donnas of the drivers, you know, and uh, line drivers. An attorney just uh, uh, came back from Saipan, made $20,000 a month there, and came back, yeah, some, uh, he brought some of my stuff for me, and he says, I'm gonna start driving the truck. I said, you're crazy. He says, yeah, he says, uh, no more litigation. So I, I was uh, one of the prima donnas, uh, line driver driving from Los Angeles to Texas, and uh, just uh, uh, my wife, uh, my Russian wife, uh, she was satisfied and uh, bought a little house here in Downey, and, and our kids were uh, going to, to uh, parochial school, and it was a good life, and now I look, uh, uh, ever, ever since I did the movie and all this, fame, let's say, uh, uh, I'm not as happy as I was then. So, uh, uh, it wasn't the war, didn't, uh, I don't know, maybe your question should be, how did uh, the movie affect me? Uh, the, the war, there's nothing negative. You know, people say, you have flashbacks, no way. Yeah, people say, well, you know, my dad is in the war, but he never talked about it. I said, well, you know, I don't tell him that. I said, he probably had nothing to talk about. That's the way I feel about guys that say, oh, hey, don't remind me of it. I said, you know, I said, oh, bullshit. Remind me about it, I'll tell you. I think we're, I think a person should, you know, unless you went out and murdering people and raping women or something, then don't remind me about it. But if you fought a good, clean war, why not talk about it? One thing that you mentioned in your book is that, um some some of the guys wanted to go out with you on on to go looking for prisoners and stuff, and you would tell them, um, "What do you need to do that for? You've already, you know, you're going to get ready to go, or you're doing a good job doing such and such else." Yeah. To what extent it sounds like then that you know you proved it to yourself too when you were when you were able to capture prisoners of war. I mean, at some level, you proved something to yourself that you didn't feel the need to. But I wanted to I'll prove more. I still have that feeling today more. Ohana says, Geez, we just bought a nice house in Modesto, uh, four bedroom house, swimming pool, the whole bit. I could never afford to do it. VA did it for me. So I, I, I don't have any, any money, but Ohana says, relax now. 
She said, write another book. She said, stay home. But I'm going back, I'm go fly again in, in Saipan, and, uh, or fly in Mexico, one or the other. Either I bring my planes back or go over there and fly. So that, that's, uh, you want to continue doing that over there? Why do I want to continue doing it now? I think it's uh, the nature of the beast. Uh, I love adventure. I, I, 74, you asked me earlier, uh, my age, uh, I'm 18 years old. Really, really, I want to go re enlist in the Marine Corps. <laughs> uh, I guess that sounds foolish. But there was another reason also. There was a time where Saipan where I wanted the Medal of Honor posthumously. Yeah, that sounds crazy, but I wanted to die for it. I said, especially with uh, Virgil Strong, I say, you don't like the Chicanos, you son of a bitch, I'll show you what a Chicano is. I'll give my life and, and show you foolish, I mean, what do you prove? But uh, I did, uh, I had no fear. Oh, there's times when I, <laughs> times that I uh, had fear, one time I went to, Japanese territory, and I was, and it got dark, and I got in uh, big boulders, big, maybe some half as big as this room, and some of the smaller. Everyone else spent the night here because I you was know, well protected, and I sat there with my knees up to my chest, and and the Americans decided to bomb that area that night, and they started shelling. I said, "Oh my God, man." Killed by my whole goddamn Marine Guard. And I sat there all night with my knees up. <coughs> I was a little shooken up that night. <coughs> Pardon me. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> hey, um, you, pu you, you published your own book. Why, why publish your own book instead of having, um, instead of going out and, and getting a publisher? Tell me, give me a name. Yeah, I want one for my other book. Who do I go to? I don't know anything about publishing. I just wrote the book and I started selling it. I don't know anything about publishing. Yeah, but um, Ohana, I guess she's pretty smart. She's from a little village you know, where they have no schools, and but she's a smart gal. And um, she says, now she's do it through a publisher. And it's a lot better book. Uh, I eliminated all that politic bullshit, uh, the Kennedy stuff, and all the right-wing stuff and and uh, just my childhood and people have asked me more about the the poverty the the depression era you'd be surprised how many rednecks read this and they love it uh so it's for everybody and uh uh and people ask me more about the war so i'm putting uh every day i i, I go through my files and and i get more incidents and and they're in my book. So it's just as big, if not maybe a few pages more than the original, in eliminating all that politics stuff that uh, sometimes I wish I had put it in there. Uh, I want to <clears throat> write more about the, uh, my breed, the Chicano. I've got that in there quite a bit. I emphasize, hey, we're fighting bastards. We're proud to be Chicanos. I wish I was, I wish I was Mexican from Mexico, because you see, you're pretty close to it, aren't you? Are your parents from Mexico? No, they're both. Oh, all right. Those that are, like Ohana, I said, Ohana, yo te envidio, Ohana. Tú tienes el cinco de mayo, tienes el de seis de septiembre, o quince, whatever it is, and all this other stuff. I said, yo no tengo nada. Yo tengo cuatro de julio. Y soy chicano, y el gabacho no, uh, dice, tú no eres, uh, you're not a real American, you're, you're a Chicano American. And so, uh, I envy the people that can go back to uh, traditions, whether they be Mexican or Russian or whatever they are, and uh, we, the Chicanos, don't have, uh, we weren't taught anything like that, you know. And I, I see where uh, the Mexican holidays or Mexican anniversary or whatever it is, in, in Los Angeles area and everybody's celebrating. I said, you know, uh, what was this about? You say, well, Hidalgo or Porfirio Diaz, I'm learning these, these things as I read about. I don't know anything about that. Not that I don't want it. I want to. Now I want to. But you see, I, I come across this in, in my book as a, as, a, as a conservative Republican. 
And I ran for Congress in, in California in um, 64. I was in Mexico City. I had a anti-communism campaign in Mexico City. I was shot at. Uh, they shot right through my rear window and busted the, my front windshield and just missed me. And uh, the liberals, I, I take it you're liberal. I'm Charlie is, and I, I'm sure you are. The liberals can be vicious. They think you're a you're a conservative, and I think it's fear. The and I've never been that type of conservative. I mean, I don't want to impress you or or I, I just tell you what I am, what I think. Uh, I love the red, white, and blue. And some people say, "Oh man, this guy's a flag waver," you know. But uh, the the liberals. I ran for Congress, and the, the it was a conservative. Conservatives from Los Angeles, they, they got a hold of me in Mexico and they says, we need you. We need you to run for Congress against uh, uh, Chet Hollyfield, who's been in Congress 22 years or whatever, Mr. Socialist. But it has to be a Chicano. No one else can beat him in the, in the 19th Congressional District, which is Whittier, Norwalk, La Mirada, and in that area. And I said, you're crazy, man. I said, I said, I'm a crude, uncouth uh, bush pilot. What the hell do I know about politics? They said, no, you can do it. And I kept on. And, I, and so then this Ray Fleischman called me. He said, guy, he says, they'll pay all your expenses. Get on a plane, come on. So I, I went back to L.A. And, and they talked to me. Chet, uh, or Eck Heastan was a congressman. He said, I says, Eck, I said, I don't know really anything about politics. I said, I don't have any money. I said, I, I said, you want to know something? Oh, he said, you're Republican? I said, no. Is you a Democrat? I said, no. I never registered. I was nothing. <laughs> so people think, you know, oftentimes when I ran, they says, how can we change your registration to, to Republican? I don't tell anything, but I didn't change. I was never registered. So anyway, I said, Jesus, uh, I just want to take money. They said, we'll take care of that. I said, I understand you need 500 signatures. They said, we'll take care of that. I said, registration costs $500. We'll take care of that. I said, well, let me think about it. So I ran. And the, uh, we went downtown LA, registered in the whole bed. And here I was running. I said, oh, on what condition? I want no opposition in the primary. He said, okay, we guarantee that. So. Everything's going smooth. They had me talking uh, here and there in uh, small groups. And Eki San says, I want you to, uh, to speak at the, uh, at the, uh, oh, re uh, the Whittier uh, Republican Summit. I says, why? I said, we've got a week to go, the deadline on registration. I says, no one is registered to, to run against me. And, he, and he says, that's all right, we want to hear you talk. So I says, all right. So I went and I talked. Now I've been talking for years. I have, I can be a little more professional, but uh, I was very crude. I spoke about what I was doing in Mexico and how I fought uh, uh, an organization in Mexico. And Martin Sobel was a member. He was, he was that uh, spy that took off for Russia. And, and uh, anyway, it's a very interesting story because I, I infiltrated them. Democrats abroad, they call it in Mexico, and, and Democrats abroad, they're a bunch of commies. And you know, I, I don't say that loosely. I mean, they, some of them are really good card-carrying members. So when I spoke uh, in Whittier, I mentioned all this, and, and I mentioned uh, Steve Fritchman's uh, group, the, uh, the Unitarian Fellowship, and which is not a Christian audience. They call themselves Christian. I mean, I don't care what a prison denomination is, but, and I spoke, and after the meeting, two women, and they had fur coats on all, one was in tears. She says, you insulted my religion. I says, what's your religion? She says, she says you're Ontarians. I says, oh. I says, well, I'll tell you what. I says, I just started. I said, I'm going to hit them hard. And let me tell you something. The liberals are strong, and they got a lot of moxie. Next day, they got there. There's only a few days ago registration. They got together 
wow, they operate so fast. Within two, three days, they had the 500 signatures. They got a guy named C. Everett Hunt to run against me. I'm in Whittier, Gavaldon in Nixon country against typical Gavacho Hunt, might as well Ben Smith, to run against me. Pff, I was dead as a Republican, so I figured, well, but I'm no dummy. I looked through my, those that, that uh, signed my petition. One guy there was C. Everett Hunt. He had signed my petition. So I got out a letter. I got my people together, and I said, hey. I said, I got him by the ass. I said, this guy's running against me. He said, I'm a good guy, and he signed my petition. So I wrote a letter to all the Republicans in the 19th Congressional District. And I said, uh, C. Everett Hunt, uh, you can forget about C. Everett Hunt now. He has, he has endorsed me. Which was no lie. He had, he had endorsed me, and I and they got there's a, a Joe. A, oh, what the, he's pretty big in Republican circles. There, he says, "Jeez, he says you're a genius." So I says, "Let's work." We worked all night on these letters. All these women volunteers came in, and I said, "I'm gonna send it out tomorrow." And they said, "No, we had two days ago." He says, "Don't because that gives them one day on." I said, no, and what if the mail doesn't come through? So I said, no, we've got to send tomorrow. And so we debated, you know, and this is, guy, it might be a mistake. And it might be the best thing you ever did. So we mailed them. That gave them one day. And boy, they got on that telephone network. <laughs> they killed me. They said that I was carrying a gun, I was a, that I fought in the Spanish-American War. <laughs> I don't think my grandfather was born then. And uh, they, they called me a wetback candidate. My Republicans, my fellow Republicans, I said, you bunch of bastards. I said, I should have been a Democrat. But I didn't know party, you see, Maggie? I didn't know Republican or Democrat. I didn't, I didn't know anything about politics. Call me Republican, call me Democrat, I don't know. Tell me this. And now today I feel more like that. I feel they're both crazy. Well, Democrats and Republicans, they're, they're all a bunch of crooks. Mr. Godlin, you know, with the, with guy. the um, guy, with, uh, with the Marine Corps not not um, you not getting Congressional Medal, Medal of Honor, it would be natural to feel some bitterness about this. I mean, you know, you did a lot. And people that have done less have, have been recognized that way. Yeah, you're right. However, uh, I feel more that I won't take the Medal of Honor. If they offer it to me right now, I will not take it. Uh, so, that kind of throws you off a little bit. Why not? I don't deserve it. I enjoyed what I was doing. I don't deserve it. That's one reason. I got another better reason. But uh, I, all I've wanted, all I've fought for for 50 years, and in this, in this article this, the other day, it states that my cause has been fighting to get the Medal of Honor for 50 years. That's a lie. I, all I've asked is uh, Lucille Roy Ball and Grace Napolitano, uh, what's name, is going to be representing her tonight. And uh, they've been very good to me. I've had a lot of sessions with them. Uh, they're striving to get the Medal of Honor. I say, no. I just want, I want them to apologize. I want them to say that they, I didn't get it because I'm a Chicano. And I, what I, I've asked for is give me a reason why you knocked the Medal of Honor down to the Silver Star and years later, upgraded that to the Navy Cross. If they had just left, left the Civil Star, they would have won. But they made a serious legal blunder by admitting that they were wrong. That's a twinge of conscience right there. So no, Maggie, uh, I, I don't say this in false humility because I'm not a humble person. Uh, you ever hear of a humble Marine? Uh, no, I don't deserve the Medal of Honor. I enjoyed what I was doing. Uh, Medal of Honor is for... I think medal, medals of honor should be awarded posthumously, uh, like it was in the old days. Now, just recently they got what, nine blacks, they just give the medal of honor. That rubbed me wrong. They got 21 Japanese Americans. They're about to get the medal now, I think next week, as a group. I just had a long, a long talk with Professor Takaki at Berkeley. We were on the year together last Sunday, uh, The uh, the national radio programs, like PBS TV, uh, I was asked to speak, uh, Juan Williams, uh, and 
he had, he had Takaki on there, Professor Takaki, and the three of us had a little round table. And Takaki, he says, this guy, he said, I've looked for you for years. He says, you're in my book. He says, he says you're my hero, and, and so on. And, and I says, you know, he was he talking about now at last they're going to recognize the, the Nisei. And I says, you know what, um, Takaki, I says, they, the Japanese who fought in Italy in the, in the uh, what is it, the 442nd, I said there are many that deserve the Medal of Honor. But to give the Medal of Honor to them as a group, as a racial group, I said that's wrong. I said I'm not for it. I said separate them. And if this guy, if, if uh, Ito or Nagasaki or whatever deserves the Medal of Honor, award it to him. But don't get a group of blacks, get a group. Now, the Marine Corps will not negotiate the Medal of Honor. I'm proud of the Medal of Honor in the Marine Corps. I have the highest medal in the Marine Corps. You know, the Navy Cross, you've heard of Chesty Puller, I'm sure. Chesty Puller was the greatest hero, Marine hero in World War II. You know what he got? Navy Cross. Never got the Medal of Honor. And now, the, you know who has stopped the Medal of Honor thing that uh, Lucille Allard has been fighting for? The Commandant of the Marine Corps. They won't negotiate the Medal of Honor. And that, to me, keeps it a prestigious award, keeps it up high and uh, the Army has cheapened it. So that's another reason why I will not accept it. Now, I don't know if I should say this. I, I don't hesitate. I say what I, what I feel and, say, and it gets me in trouble. But if President Clinton were to take the president, not necessarily, but he'd use these president, if he were to award it to me, I would say, sir, I can't accept this from you. That's all. Walk away. Not because of his uh, little immorality in the White House. Not, not every president has had their concubines. I don't approve of President uh, uh, disgracing the, the, the office. But because he demonstrated against my son when he was in the Marine Corps during the Vietnam thing, he demonstrated against the Marines. He killed Marines. He and James Ponda killed Marines. I can't forgive him for that. He went to Moscow and demonstrated against them. Against, hey, I don't like that Vietnam War. I'm against. I was against Vietnam War, but not not because of the liberal liberals' reason. I'm against it because it was nothing but a trap. Now one Russian was lost. Lost there. We had no business there. But when my son was fighting. I say, don't tie one hand behind his back. Whether we're right or wrong, back our boys. And he didn't do it. He, when he was in Oxford, he went to Moscow and demonstrated against the Marine Corps. Mr. Governor, then let me ask you this one last question, and then I know that people are waiting for you. But um, no, that's right. I enjoy talking. Okay. <laughs> um, I can't go over another th four hours. <laughs> Sitting in the water. <laughs> Would you like some water? No, thanks. I don't smoke. The uh, the role of Saipan in the war. What 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 strategic role did Saipan play? Very strategic. Very important. It was from Saipan that we started bombing Japan from a land based uh, air, uh, airport uh, before it was from the uh, from an aircraft carrier, and so it became very very important to take that. But that's a good question. There's islands that we lost, a lot of Marines that we didn't have to take. We bypassed Truk. We could have bypassed Tarawa. Tarawa is nothing. And instead of bypassing, we hit Tarawa and we lost thousands of Marines. And, and through uh, stupid blunders of, of the tide, the Marines waded ashore, uh, chest deep, holding the rifles above their heads. Each one got it right between the eyes. The Japanese laying there on the beach picking them off. Uh, so uh, Saipan wasn't that way. Saipan was a must. And let me tell you, it was close. The Japanese Navy was coming at us. If, and they were defeated there by our Navy. If they were not defeated, every one of us Marines on Saipan would have been killed naturally. Uh, it, was, uh, it was tight, it was very tight. We killed over 30,000 Japanese troops there. The toughest division they ever had. That was the Manchurian Division, the Rape of Nanking. 
they were ruthless. And we killed over 30, I think it was 33,000, over 30,000 Japanese. Thank God I got a thousand of them alive. I never realized that. It was said that recently at uh, one of the talks I gave, I guess maybe it was Rick Aguita introduced me. He says, you know, he says, a gentleman, uh, just before he committed suicide, ordered his troops to kill seven Americans to every one Japanese. And he says, you know, he says, Gavaldon kept 1,000 Japanese from killing Americans. He says, Gavaldon saved 7,000 Marines. That's not, that's not true. That's an exaggeration. But let's say I saved 700. Let's say I, I saved 70. Let's say I saved seven. I think that's pretty good. Guy, okay, I've just got to, I've got to make sure I understand this. You say that, that World War II did not change your life so much as the, as the movie changed your life. World War II changed everybody's life. But you mean the profound impact? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I find it hard to believe that it was, it was another adventure for you, like going off to Alaska to work in the canneries. I mean, this, this had... It was another adventure. I was having a good time. I, I enjoyed what I was doing. Uh, uh, no one enjoys killing. Uh, I'm not a sadist. Uh, but uh, when I picked somebody off, I never lost any sleep over killing the, the enemy. And a lot of people say, how do you feel about killing people that, uh, a race of people that you were lived with? You know, sometimes I, I really don't understand how that question would be put to me. If a fellow American has a rifle pointed at me, I'll shoot him. So I didn't kill Japanese, I killed the enemy. I never thought I was killing my, my people. If, uh, uh, if we went to war with Latin America someplace, let's not, not Mexico, let's say Guatemala, my people, our people, our Latinos, hey, the guy wants to kill me, I'll, I, I don't care if he's from Guatemala or Cucamonga. But, if, but to some Latinos that we've talked to in this project, they've, they've said that fighting the war made them feel like they were entitled, that they were, this was their country after all, and after the war they just didn't feel like they should have to, to uh, accept any second-class treatment. We shouldn't accept second-class treatment regardless of war or no war. Uh, you know, when they, what was it, a year ago or so, they, they got these wetbacks coming up in, uh, in a truck you know, on, on a freeway there in Los Angeles, do you see the, 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 the video on that? They got this uh, woman or a couple guys that did get off of the truck and pulling her off, pulling her by her hair. I say, hey, we don't deserve that. You know, when they, uh, uh, I can fight prejudice. I can fight discrimination. I'll punch a son of a bitch in the mouth. But uh, a lot of our people can't fight. So it, you're a fighter. Charlie's a hell of a fighter. And I think I am in my way. I wasn't always because I never felt that burning uh, patriotismo mexicanismo until the last maybe 20, 30 years. Then I started feeling it when I lived in Mexico and then here the, the, the prejudice that the, the, the horrible incidents of, uh, I remember one time I was driving a truck years ago, back in the late 50s, I think, and I was going up uh, the valley, San Joaquin Valley, and I had to stop in Porterville overnight. And uh, there's a sign there that says, we went to a bar, this, this Russian guy and myself, and the sign says, no Mexicans allowed, or we don't serve Mexicans, something to that effect. We went in. Nobody asked me if I was Mexican or not. I had to have a beer. Before night was over, I walked out with the cutest little blonde and went to a motel. And you know, you know why I did that? And I figured, you son of a bitch, you say no Mexican loud, I'll take your best girl. It wasn't because I wanted her. It was to prove something. So I, I can fight. I can fight. If I can't beat you physically, I'll beat you psychologically. I've always had that, uh, that feeling. I used to deliberately go in, in Oakey Bars and in, in uh, Billy Goat Acres, uh, uh, Bell Gardens, uh, Oakey Bars and, and Texan Bars and walk out with the cutest little girl. They, why? 
was this because I, I wanted some sex or wanted this broad? No. I said, you bastards, I'm better than you are. So, um, I think I'm very fortunate. Some of this is discrimination. Against, I, I got thrown in jail in Saipan last year. I was the chief of police prior to that. I was in, I actually got thrown in jail. They took me, they took me to the <laughs> police station in three minutes I was out. Uh, we're walking out of Wendy's. We, we have, uh, uh, Saipan is halfway modern. We got, we got a Wendy's, we got a uh, Taco Bell and so on. Anyway, we're walking out and this guy, he's half my age, he was a former Marine, twice my size, and he says something about my Jap wife. So he and his gal were sitting there. So I say, you no good son of a bitch. He used to fly for me, this guy. He was one of my pilots. And um, I hit him. And he gets up and Ohana says, later she told me, she says, I never thought you were that fast. She says, you hit him six times before you hit the deck. I thought I hit him twice. His wife went screaming and grabbed the phone and called the cops. Here comes the cops and here comes the ambulance. The guy was bleeding in all directions. I broke his nose, he's bleeding out of his mouth, his ears. And, uh, and these young cops just out of the academy, they didn't know me. And they says, well, they look at him, they look at me. I thought they were going to tell him, you got to be ashamed of yourself, the guy twice my size. And this is about a year and a half ago. And so they put cuffs on, you just put your hands behind your back, you know. Hey, I'm the chief, man. <laughs> so and I don't say anything. You know, they go in the car, we go to the police station. All my old captains, hey, what the hell are you doing, guy? <laughs> and and uh, he says, come here. They, they take the, something that I, I could never believe. He says, he says, guy, you won't believe this. He says, look, they had two pairs of handcuffs on me. I said, I must be a mean son of a bitch. <laughs> Two pairs of handcuffs. So uh, I'll still fight at, at my age. Uh, I don't say this in a cocky way, I, but you ask me some things that uh, pertain to this personality. Uh, I think I'll die with it. I hope I will. I don't want to die a, a, a cripple of a man on crutches. <laughs> Yeah, let me just ask one question, Guy. You, uh, you alluded to it, and my opinion <clears throat> of you is always that you had, you had to have had some sort of a, a death wish or something when you were out there on Saipan. And the example you used of who, you, uh, were you from Boyle Heights and the guy from Maravilla, automatically you think, hey, let's, we got to duke it out. We got to prove who's, who's the big, the, the top person or establish some sort of, uh, I'm not sure just what it is, identity. Well, my thought, that that particular incident was not that. I, we're both elated. Uh, here's two Chicanos from L.A. Uh, you never think that possible. Here we are uh, being shot at by the Japanese, and we're, it, it was a beautiful feeling to see a fellow Chicano. There weren't many Chicanos in the Marine Corps, you know, no, but, but, but there wasn't a feeling of, of no, we're going to show. <coughs> Territory mm -hmm. about Maravilla, about Boyle Heights, yeah. uh, the fact that uh, both of you knew, although you were friendly, uh, you knew that this was the the enemy. In fact, that you know, hey, guys in Maravilla were entitled to go beat up guys from Boyle Heights, and the, the gang thing that is going on and on and on in East Well, Johnny, and, is, and then when you transfer it to whoever else you're told is the enemy, over in yeah, the yeah, but you know. You're much younger than me. I don't think you can. I don't think you can see uh, East LA back then in, in your mind's eye. There wasn't that animosity between gangs. There was, there was a Palo Verde. There was a Maravilla, Boyle Heights, the Flats. But I don't remember any gang wars. I don't remember any uh, invading somebody. I hell, I used to go. Uh, when we were 14, 15 years old. We used to walk up to. Um, uh, the original burrito was uh, Vicky's, mm -hmm. up in Maravilla, and we're from, uh, yeah. there was never any fear of somebody saying, hey, where are you from? No, there was no gangs, there was no, there was no real territory. I mean, we knew Vicky's was in Maravilla, to make any difference to us. Or we go to Maravilla to go to some bar or something. No, nowadays, what is it, the Crips and the Bloods and the, and the different gangs, 
Nowadays, there, there, are, there are territories uh, back then. Maybe I, maybe I misinterpreted your, your, your question. Ya ven, ya mero, ya mero acabamos. Ya me preguntaron de todas uh, las novias que yo tenía, y entonces ya, ya puedes entrar. But there was rivalry. I mean, obviously it wasn't the vicious thing with the guns that you have now, but there were rivalries, and whether it was White Fence or Manaya or whoever, that were, you had to go establish your territory or your turf, and, and you had to defend your buddies. Charlie, uh, seriously, this, honestly, I don't remember anything like that. Hmm. We, were in, we were in Boyle Heights, and... Uh, to go to flats? We're talking 40s now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah so 39, 40. Get introduced till the 50s. Yeah, well, that's why I say I don't know. I don't know anything about that era. Yeah. I don't. I don't. Uh, by then, I was out of the Marine Corps. I was. Uh, I went back to Alaska, uh, and I don't now. What I hear and what I read, the guys drive by and brum, we didn't have anything like that. We didn't, there was never any, you know, matter of kick the hell out of you. No, 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 no. Okay, but let's get no. back to you, whether you see the same, the same kind of rivalry transferring over to the Marine Corps and you're told who the, the bad guy is or the good guy is. And, and what, <clears throat> what, what made you go out? Uh, and you didn't go out to kill necessarily. Maybe if Schwabi was right. Maybe I want to be a prima donna. Maybe I don't know. I'm trying to answer your question. Schwabi says you're no prima donna. He says, we don't have prima donnas in the Marine Corps. Maybe I just want to prove, hey, I'm a tough son of a bitch. Maybe I'm I'm real macho. I don't know, Charlie. I, you know, I ask myself that many times. I I don't know. I just, I wanted to. I was, I was going to be a tough son of a bitch. I was going to kill more than any other Marine. I was going to do something. Yeah, fear, I, I, I didn't know it. I instance of fear, maybe, in certain circumstances. One, if you had time, I'll tell you, one time I, was, I, I got scared. You know, there's, um, the scouts and snipers are the real prima donnas in the Marine Corps. They, they're known to be the sharpest, the elite. Every regiment has their scout and sniper unit. And uh, there was a sergeant, uh, oh, a guy from the scout and snipers, he came to our OP and he says, uh, Captain Schwab, he says, he says, we need somebody to speak Japanese. He says, we're going to Japanese territory tonight. We're gonna go reconnoiter the, the area. I said, hey, I'll go. You're out of battery. I'll tell you this anyway. Oh. Uh, it's, it was blinking. I think it's out of tape, it's one of these. Oh, yeah. okay. Hang on, stop it. All right. If you just push that little red button. Yeah. Tons of, of uh, videos uh, of Saipan and Tinian, my landings there. The, I got 5,000 head of cattle and goats and pigs there. They're all mine. They're, they're wild, but they're all mine. I got all this on, on video. Uh, cool. Thank uh, thank God for Sony. You Sony too? Mm -hmm. Anyway, okay. well, all right, the scout snipers. Gibson, Hoot Gibson, we call him that. Every, every Gibson's gonna be Hoot, you know, from the old movie, the Western movie. So, Hoot Gibson comes and, and he says, uh, come on, sit down. Uh, he says, uh, we, need, uh, we need an interpreter to go on this patrol. So naturally, uh, I say, hey, man, that's, that's my bag, I'll go. So, we, uh, there's 19 of them. And Hurley, my good buddy Hurley, he says, I'll go with you. Gabby, they call me, I, I hate that. I shouldn't have told you. But <laughs> and he says, hey, Gabby, he says, I'll go with you. And I said, all right. So we set it up that night, we're gonna go into, we had a line established across the island. You know, sandbags, the whole bit, you know. And, and uh, so uh, that night we're gonna leave, I guess about nine o'clock, I forget the exact hour, but anyway, there's 19 of them, but they wanted a corpsman as well, so they get a guy named Scully, who was a regimental corpsman. You know what a corpsman is. Uh, they're the, the medics of the Marine Corps, yeah. and they're Navy personnel, but boy, they're tough. They make good, they wear the Marine uniform, and, and they're considered Marines by us. So anyway, Scully volunteers, and so here we go. I take up the tail end, and there's 19 scouts and snipers come up a little hill-like, and then, it was Scully, Hurley, and me. 
So we're waiting and waiting. These guys, boy, they work as a unit quietly. So here, oh man, it must be about nine o'clock. So I says, eight, 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 eight. I said, find out what's happening. So I heard he tapped Scully. Scully goes to tap the next guy, he's not there. They're gone. Boy, they're quiet. They just shh, right down the hill into Japanese territory. They went over the, the, the bags and into Japanese territory. I said, oh my God, man, they're gonna call us chicken shit. They're gonna call us yellow. And I said, we gotta go. I said, you guys don't have to. I said, I'm going. So we're getting down to the line. There's a second lieutenant there and, and uh, the, the Marines are all the way across the island, right on up the mountain down to the other side, the, the stationary line. So he said, oh, he says, they're gone. He says, they went, they're, they're in Japanese territory. So I said, Lieutenant, I'm going after him. I said, by then Scully and, and the Hurley said they'd go. So anyway, we, we jump over the, the bags, the, the line there, and the Lieutenant said, you're crazy, man. You're crazy, you're going right into sure death, you know. So uh, I'll never forget, it was halfway m uh, moonlit night because I could see the palm trees, beautiful. It's, uh, it was a Dorothy L'Amour type of thing, you know. So here we go into the Japanese territory and we go way on in and look for our 19, which was suicide because they were so quiet, we didn't find them anyway. So we scouted around, finally said, okay, we proved ourselves, let's go. So going back that night, <clears throat> the, the uh, 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 cities uh, were, were the password. Yeah, cities, but you whistle twice. And so coming back, I said, okay, we're getting near the line. So I whistled. I, I had a pretty good whistle. Uh, we used to use that in East LA. Our, our gang had a certain whistle. And so I whistled twice. Every son of a bitch and his brother opened up. With everything, a machine gun, brr, and the M1, pop, 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 the old threes, and hand grenades. I said, oh my God, this is a farmer's field. We we're down in the furrows. We're way down in the furrows of this field, you know. And, uh, and I said, my God, man, how do you fire back at your own men? And there's thousands of them, th thousands of Marines, and behind us is the enemy. <clears throat> we we're all just 18 years old, just kids. I says, damn, I says, uh, we'll try again. So I whistled, brrr, bum, 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 <laughs> grenades in the whole bit. And Hurdy, uh, Scully, start crying. I don't blame him, I should have cried too. And he says, we're gonna die. I said, yeah, we're gonna die. He says, he says oh my God, he says, this is gonna, gonna kill us right now. So I, at that time I was scared. I says, we have no choice. So I jumped up and I ran for the lines. And I, I said, don't shoot, you bunch of bastards, don't fire. And one guy says, uh, password, I says, Los Angeles. He says, Honolulu, and so on, counting. Now, I'll never forget, it was a city, because he says, okay, he says, okay, LA, come on in. So I jumped the fence, I said, you dirty sons of bitches. I said, I, what the goddamn hell you doing? I said, he said, what's the answer? It was up the line. So I go up the line. I said, no, it's down the line. I said, you bunch of dirty bastards. So I says, Hurley, Scully, come on. And these guys take off like, a, like jackrabbits, man, over the, over the uh, sandbags and all. And Hurley wanted to kill. Boy, he, he, wanted to, he was going to shoot the first guy he saw there. And, uh, and then the lieutenant says, he says, well, he says you idiots. He says, the, the, the scouts of Cyprus came back in. They had already come back into the American lines. So I figured anybody else that's out there must be Japanese. <laughs> yeah, there were times when I was scared. I was scared that night. You know, how do you fight your own men? I mean, who are you going to shoot? you got a thousand Marines there, and you fire and they know where you are and you're dead. So that was one of the incidents. All right. All right. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank that was a you good very way much to end. for taking the time to yeah. talk to us. Well, I hope I didn't bore you. We look forward to tonight.